My earliest memories come from playing in the dirt. Growing up in California, running around my backyard with my dog named Puppy, picking grapes off the grapevine, feeding some to her, and then eating some myself. I also remember picking strawberries and digging up carrots with my parents and my older sister. I'm sure at the time my parents didn't realize that the seeds that they were sowing into me and the seeds that I was planting into the ground would chart my life trajectory. I'm sure my parents were doing what they thought any average middle-class black family should be doing, having two kids, their own home, an above-ground pool, a dog, and a garden to sometimes tend to, but most of the time forget. You see, black families in agriculture are terms that you typically don't hear together in a positive light, but that wasn't always the case. Before the first enslaved Africans arrived in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619, agriculture was king. In countries such as Guinea, agriculture played a huge role in their lives. And crops such as Indian corn, pineapples, and pepper grew with abundance. The knowledge of how to work the land and care for the land came with my ancestors to the United States. But too often, that same land that they cared for became the site where they received physical punishments that they would remember for a lifetime. For a lifetime. My earliest introductions to agriculture were playing in my garden and maybe a science class or two where I learned about photosynthesis. The one lesson my school would teach me every year was that my ancestors grew cotton and tobacco for 265 years in the South and then worked as sharecroppers well into the 1960s in Mississippi. My school lessons never mentioned how blacks went from owning almost no land after the Civil War to owning almost 15 million acres by the 1920s. This land was used to build shelter, feed communities, and was passed down in the family as a form of generational wealth. Unfortunately, that stretch towards achieving the American dream was short-lived with the rise of the Ku Klux Klan running black families off their land. At the same time, discrimination in county USDA offices led to the late delivery of loans to black farmers and sometimes even the straight up denial of those loans to those black farmers. With this painful history, it's no surprise that we've seen a decline in the number of black farmers and a negative stigma surrounding the profession as a whole. I'll admit, working in agriculture is not the most glamorous job, but by reimagining agricultural practices, we just might be able to fix some of the nation's most pressing issues. I'm talking about issues such as childhood obesity, infant mortality, and high healthcare spending. By reimagining agricultural practices, we just might be able to eliminate food deserts, boost economic development, and reduce the number of renal clinics found in our most disadvantaged neighborhoods. By returning to agriculture, we have these opportunities. Now, I'm not saying that we all have to go out and buy a farm today. I'm saying we can start a little smaller. We can start by investing in school and community gardens. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, being physically active for at least 2.5 hours a day reduces your risk for high blood pressure. It also reduces your risk for diseases such as obesity, as well as premature death. And it gets better. A 2010 study found that Gardening actually lowers your stress more than reading a book. And the benefits don't stop there. Studies show that school gardens are being used to enhance academic instruction and are also being used as part of the curriculum to teach classes such as math, science, and even history. As for community gardens, they're gaining national recognition for, the, for their ability to increase property values as well as bring people together from all works of life. We have some amazing opportunities here, but we have to be proactive. 
what's so amazing about these opportunities is it's happening in our own backyard. In our beloved city of Tallahassee, we have organizations such as the Mayan Garden Project that is committed to nourishing our community. Since 1992, the Mayan Garden Project has been planting gardens in school and community yards to increase access to healthy foods. And they're not the only ones. The Tallahassee Food Network launched a youth entrepreneurship and empowerment program called I Grow Whatever You Like. For years, I would spend my Saturday mornings buying fresh kale and carrots from these youth entrepreneurs and seeing a glimpse in what it means to be my ancestors' wildest dreams. Our ancestors never left us without the tools we need to be successful. We've just lost our way along the path. Luckily for us, there's organizations such as these two that are committed to revitalizing the foundation that our ancestors left for us. If we want to nourish our bodies, if we want to heal our communities, and if we want to rebuild those same communities, we must return to agricultural practices. And we can start by investing in school and community gardens in our own local community. Thank you.